Howdy y'all, Andy here, and welcome to another episode of King's Comics. Now, it's occurred to me recently that I haven't actually done a haul video for, well, I guess any month of this year, much less January of this year, and I have people upon occasion asking in the comments section, whether that's on Facebook or Instagram even, what I've gathered or what I've been reading. So, now what I've been reading, watching, and even playing is going to be in a different video, and hopefully some reviews to follow in addition to what I've been kind of consuming, so to speak, over the past month and year. That being said, today we're just going to go ahead and do a haul video over everything, or at least I think everything, that I gathered during the month of January. So let's go ahead and break that down and dive right in. I'll be starting off because I'm an avid comic reader, which you probably have picked up on by now. We're going to go ahead and start with my collected uh, single copy issues. Now, I've done reviews for some of these, but for those who are asking for my Spider-Man reviews or even Green Lantern reviews, there's I've kind of got a backlog going on right now, so a lot more reviews are going to be dropping out soon. So, that being said, let's get started. So, I picked up Guardians of the Galaxy, the Kate's Run. Um, I've actually got two copies of that, one for this past month, January, and one for this month, February, but I only picked up the first one recently. And then I got Witches, uh, Bad, the Bad Egg Special by Scott Snyder and Jock, who I love their work together. They worked on Witches for Image Comics, and this was kind of a special one-off issue for that. So hopefully we get a full-blown sequel soon. Then, oh, hey, here's Green Lantern by uh, Grant Morrison. Now, I need to do a review for that one, but as a slight aside, I love Grant Morrison as an author. He's one of the most prolific authors in the comic medium, so that's kind of why I just went ahead and bought it day one. Uh, then Wolverine the Long Night. Actually, my review on that is already posted on the first two issues of this. It's an adaptation of the podcast on Spotify, so I'd really recommend giving that a listen. Maybe I'll do a spoiler summary of that podcast here directly. We've also got The Punisher. This is by Matt Rosenberg, uh, or Rosenberg. He is an indie author who started writing for Marvel relatively recently, I guess. But he actually wrote the previous Punisher run, and he's written a, a, a Kingpin comic. And his previous Punisher run for Marvel actually had Frank Castle donning a War Machine suit that Nick Fury essentially gave him access to. Because putting a dangerous vigilante in an Iron Man suit of armor is a great idea. Next up we have, uh, oh, this is my uh, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number one. And it's the uh, Andrew Robinson, who I just love, uh, his variant cover. Now, I already did a review. I posted a review for that as well, and I've actually got the first three issues of that run. So I'll be posting those out as soon as I get a chance as well. And then we've got Edge of Spider-Geddon number two. So uh, Penny Parker, who many of y'all will remember from as a little girl who piloted the Japanese, I guess, anime mecha spider in a spider robot in Into the, Sp Edge Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, she's actually one of my favorite alternate Spider-Men because her... I guess just her alternate Spider-Man take has a lot of anime and manga influence, or manga influence, so I really like that. So Edge of the Spider-Verse 2, because she doesn't have her own standalone comic, was a great reintroduction to that character and uh, just that world in general. So then we've got a, oh yeah, that's right, the new uh, John Wick series is coming out from Dynamite Comics. Uh, this is kind of uh, providing a little bit of a, a backstory into John Wick's past, and uh, I've got multiple issues of this as well. Those reviews are coming up because... Uh, John Wick 3 Parabellum is also coming out soon. Now, I've got a couple What If comics from Marvel. For those who don't know, DC typically does Elseworlds whenever they want to uh, do alternate universe, and Marvel likes to do What If stories. So they'll just come up with random scenarios for different beloved storylines or characters, and I've got two of them, which are um, uh, the What If Flash Thompson or Spider-Man, that review coming out too, and then What If the... X-Men, let me make sure I've got this right, we're the dot .exe, you know, as in dot .executable men. So I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of cyber influence there. I haven't actually read that one yet. Like I said, I'm pretty far behind on my inventory. Next up, we have Captain Marvel number one. Actually, that movie is dropping next week, next Wednesday. Oh my gosh, I'm losing track. So I uh, can't wait to see it and put a review out on that. But uh, yeah, I love the previous Captain Marvel iterations. Uh, I mean, even when she was Miss Marvel during the uh, Brian Michael Bendis days at Marvel, she was a fantastic and well-developed character. But uh, we got to see how that plays out in the movie and in this comic series. So next up, we have, uh, speaking of Brian Michael Bendis, we have Naomi number one from DC. Uh, Brian Michael Bendis made the switch to DC. He's actually writing Superman right now. Uh, from Marvel. He's one of the most prolific Marvel authors or writers, and uh, he created an original character for DC named Naomi. Now, 
I have multiple issues of this as well, but the idea of new heroes emerging or new characters emerging within the big two, that's Marvel and DC, it really fascinates me. So I want to check this out, publish a review, because I really like the idea of Brian Michael Bendis inventing new characters, not just rehashing old ones for DC um, in what's about to be, I'm assuming, a long-standing tenure with them. Next up, oh yeah, actually, this is one of my uh, favorite series. I, uh, it's called Tomboy. And it's by, let me make sure I've got this right, Action Lab, who I, this is the only book by them I've actually read, and as, so far it's been the only one I've been immediately interested in. But Tomboy tell, is kind of this, uh, I guess, deconstruction of the Maho Shoujo genre, which is, you know, the magical girl genre of uh, manga and a anime influence. So a lot of people who watch Sailor Moon are probably uh, familiar with that. I think even, uh, oh gosh, Steven Universe takes some, adapts some of those uh, elements into the storyline. So with this, we actually see a much darker, twisted version. It's like, a, I'd say it's like the Punisher meets Sailor Moon. So very disturbing. I love it. And I managed to finally get the uh, final three issues so I could finish the storyline and probably make a recommendation off of that. But because it's a limited issue, it's probably best to pursue it, uh, limited series, it's probably best to pursue it online um, to read it di by digital because I don't think the trades are even uh, being published anymore. Pretty hard to come by. So then we get to The Batman Who Laughs, number one. The Batman Who Laughs, for those who might be familiar with him, is created by Scott Snyder through, through the DC Metal comic run. Now, I loved Metal. It was a fantastic, just little, I guess, um, side event for the DC Universe that led into uh, DC Rebirth, which has been phenomenal, especially the Tom King Batman. But the Batman Who Laughs was this kind of amalgamation of Batman and the Joker, and I won't go into how that comes about, but that will be discussed in a review later, because just the alternate Batman that are revealed in DC Metal are all fascinating and just incredibly twisted versions of the Dark Knight. Man, oh man, I forgot about this one. This is a this is, a, I believe it's pronounced Sarai. Uh, actually, I found this because I was hunting around on Amazon for some new comics and solicitations coming up, and I stumbled on this randomly. So I have no idea what to expect going into this. Uh, it just looked kind of interesting, and every now and again, I try to just pick up random comics just to review or to read, just to uh, kind of, you know, refresh just my love of the medium, just to explore different comics and uh, material. Because, it's, I mean, DC and Marvel are great, but there's so much more out there, like Image Comics, uh, Fantagraphics, Pantheon, all these different pun uh, punishers, publishers out there. And, uh, yeah, I just want to read that and just keep exploring. And then next up is... Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man number two, that review dropping soon, as well as the review for number three. Now we get to Cosmic Ghost Rider. Actually, I just wanted to have the number one of this because Donny Cates, the author, is incredible. Everything he's put out has been phenomenal so far, um, uh, from Baby T to, well, he put out a Cosmic Ghost Rider trade recently, the collection of all the issues of this limited series, and he created Cosmic Ghost Rider in the uh, Thanos run that he did following Jeff Lemire's Thanos run. So I think that was called uh, Thanos Wins. Either way, that led into his recent Guardians of the Galaxy comic, where Cosmic Ghost Rider is a member of that team. Now, if for those of you who may notice the uh, symbol on his chest, that should be a dead giveaway, as crazy as it might seem, of who Cosmic Ghost Rider is, with that identity being concealed. But I'm not going to mention that. Maybe drop it down in the comment below. But uh, that will be discussed, once again, in my review of this trade paperback which is the collection of those issues. Now, we already discussed uh, Spider-Gwen, Ghost Spider. That is a review I've published and posted as well. It looks like a lot of people had an interest in this comic, so I might have to go ahead and follow that up. I decided I'm going to trade weight on this one and wait for the first volume to come out before I do a fleshed-out review. But, you know, I was kind of on the fence about the first issue, so we'll see what the creative team does from there. Then, Marvel Knights. I've got a lot of catching up to do on this. Marvel Knights was published way back, I mean, a couple, I'd say decades ago even, or a decade and a half ago, when Marvel was doing a kind of a, a edgy, more mature reinvention of a lot of characters so that they could do, once again, a lot of more mature storylines. And uh, Donny Cates, actually, who I just mentioned, was uh, writing this reiteration of Marvel Knights. So that was very interesting, but I think it was just a limited run of six issues or so, but I'm having a bit of difficulty tracking them down just because I lost track that this series was even going on. But then we have Wolverine the Long Night, number two. Actually, you know what? My apologies. This one came out in February. So check that out in the next video, my February haul. 
Now we go to DC Heroes in Crisis. This one is by Tom King, who is currently writing Batman for DC. And in Heroes in Crisis, he pretty much investigates the idea of uh, how heroes, superheroes, deal with uh, mental health, trauma, and PTSD. Except for, I mean, just there's a twist, it's a murder mystery, and you have this whole detective story going on with how superheroes are not just dealing with this, but dealing with the idea of someone uh, just crashing down on their, it's called Sanctuary, this place where they seek that refuge, uh, crashing down and just raining down destruction and mayhem on it, and just the aftermath of all of that. So I can't wait to plunge into this and review it for everyone. Um, issue 6 dropped, and it's a 9-issue limited run, so that'll be super easy to truck through. And actually, just going off the first several issues, I highly recommend it to everyone, especially because 9 issues is not that much of an investment, but at the same time, hey, maybe just trade wait it out. You know, wait for the whole collection to come out and then pursue it. Or wait for it to come to your local library. As always, I try to recommend people go to their public library if possible, but I know that a lot of the times that's kind of hard to do depending on where you're at. But I've actually got about, let's see, in the month of January, I believe I managed to pick up Heroes in Crisis issue 2, 3, and 4. So, yeah, that was just something that I was... Uh, looking to catch up on. Well, one, two, three, and four. So four issues of Heroes in Crisis. Then we get to Daredevil, number one. For those who, once again, may have been keeping up with the Charles Soule Daredevil run, you may be aware that Matt Murdock may or may not be deceased. Now, I say that because this leads into the current Daredevil run by Chip Zdarsky, who some of you may know because of his artwork as well as writing for, I think, Jughead and his, uh, I think, artwork for Sex Criminals, which is written by Matt Fraction. But this Daredevil run is something I've been stoked on because Zdarsky's just been up and coming as a writer, not just an artist. So I want to check that out because issue two just dropped this past month as well. Next we have the Batman Who Laughs number two. So far the issue has been uh, pretty, in I'm just going to say interesting. I always like what Scott Snyder and that artist Jock work on. And Jock is actually a, I guess, uh, a, a concept artist and storyboarder cinematically as well. I think he's worked on movies like Ex Machina, but that'll be discussed a little bit more in my single issue reviews. But uh, he actually introduces a new character, in, or they introduce a new character in this issue, which is the Grim Knight, who's kind of a henchman, I suppose, for uh, the, uh, the Batman who laughs. So wait to see how that kind of unfolds, because the Grim Knight is also getting his own standalone issue or series, and we'll see how that unfolds soon. Oh yeah, this was one I was actually really interested in too. Um, like I said, I bought that comic Sarai because I was hunting around on Amazon and seeing what was available. And I went ahead and picked up, actually I technically picked up three of these, but uh, The Life of Frederick Douglass. So there aren't just superhero comics or manga or what have you. I mean, and indie comics, right? Like Image puts out, like Invincible. But at the same time, uh, so I like biographical uh, graphic novels as well. So this is the case with uh, the life of Frederick Douglass, um, you know, and it's uh, just, it's pretty obvious what it's about just based on the title. But the problem is I accidentally, uh, there was a clerical error, so to speak, on when I was uh, ordering it. So I actually ordered three of them. I only kept one and I uh, gave away the other two. Uh, right now I gave one to my mom and I'm donating the uh, other one to my, uh, the public library in my hometown, Hutto, because I still go to church out there and I still uh, inv try to invest in the city and the community. So I mean, as much as I can, really. It's just a lot of, I, I'm rambling. Either way, um, it's a good book. I just like the idea of exploring not just, um, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass or historical events in general, but the idea of, like, these period pieces that do explore or rehash uh, biographies of uh, pivotal figures globally, not just in America, but just global figures who had uh, just huge, huge impacts. Speaking of biographical graphic novels or biographical comics, we come into uh, one of the, I guess, just kind of quintessential comics that I realized I hadn't read and still haven't read, which is uh, Persepolis, which tells the story of, I believe, a uh, Middle Eastern woman, the, uh, uh, the author in general, uh, Marjane Satrapi, supposing that I say that correctly, um, told in two volumes. Now, I'm going to be go, uh, reading that one as doing a recommended reading on this, whether it's, well, I'm not going to say whether it's worth your time or not, because this is a, like I said, it's a very pivotal and quintessential uh, work in the graphic novel medium, so it's something that I need to explore personally and just kind of gather my thoughts on. Then, because I realized I hadn't done a lot of Aquaman reading, other than a predominantly Jeff Johns run, including The Trench, which had a huge part in the, uh, or a huge part in the 
in guiding the storyline of the Aquaman movie that came out last year, I got Aquaman the Water Bearer. Now, this is another DC event that I've had to read, or I guess uh, just Aquaman arc that I've had to be reading. A uh, Aquaman comic arc that I've had to be re been reading for a while, and uh, I just haven't. So it actually involves Aquaman's hand becoming this kind of mystical water gauntlet, if you will, that he can uh, control uh, just water with and form weapons out of. So I guess that gives him hydrokinesis for a while, which is the power that is, uh, I guess, why for love interest, depending on the run you read, uh, Mera displays. So I've been wanting to read that for a while, and I finally managed to... I finally managed to find a copy for a relatively decent price, so that was good. Next we have Volume 10 of Zack Snyder and... Zack Snyder? Of Scott Snyder and Greg Capolo's Batman run for DC The New 52. Uh, it's funny because I've got 8 out of 10 volumes, and this is the last one, the epilogue of the series. But I'm still missing Volume 9. I'm working on getting that in hardcover, but it's just not at a price point I want to spend. I'm trying to check if it's a thrift store or half price books, but the sooner I acquire it, the sooner that I have that collection completed. And uh, in terms of recommendations, y'all, I, I highly recommend that uh, any Batman fan will check out that run. I love Greg Capolo's art, and I love Scott Snyder's writing. And actually, they're the same team that worked on DC Metal, which ba uh, Batman, their, uh, their New 52 run, all leads to points and, four, and uh, I guess, oh gosh, four warns everything going on in the DC Metal event. So that was pretty cool. And uh, yeah, I just love the run, and I like what's, that Scott Snyder is still writing for DC. Oh yeah, because he's writing uh, Justice League right now. How did I forget that? But anyways, y'all, I did not just get... I did not just get comics this month. I also managed to pick up a few other items as well. So those were my physical comics, my trades and volumes, as well as my single issues. But I managed to grab, let's see, I managed to grab some uh, DVDs as well, and digital movies and digital games. But mainly, I managed to grab a Ninja Scroll. I managed to grab Ninja Scroll and uh, Justice League: The New Frontier. So these two are kind of interesting because Ninja Scroll is apparently just a, a widely regarded and acclaimed uh, work of animation for just people who enjoy not just anime and manga, but like just animated films in general. I mean, I watched it. It was very gory. It uh, had some sexual content in it. So <clears throat> for the younger viewers out there, as I always say, please, please, please talk to your parents. And for the parents out there, um, you know, it is pretty graphic, so I can't say that I recommend it at all for uh, younger viewers, but the art is pretty insane. The animation is pretty incredible, too, considering it came out in the 80s or 90s, so I was pretty impressed with it, but once again, there's some very graphic content. And then for the uh, Justice League, The New Frontier, oh, I should mention, uh, the reason why I got this on DVD was because if you watched one of my previous haul or collection videos, I had, <clears throat> I had bought the steel book of that and discovered it was a I guess, British or UK um, region locked CD or uh, Blu-ray disc, so I couldn't watch it. So I needed the English, uh, the US region locked DVD so I could actually watch the movie that I had already bought. Now we get to Justice League The New Frontier, and I love my steelbooks, y'all, so as soon as I saw this on sale at a thrift store, I needed to get it. Um, DC The New Frontier was written by Darwin Cook. It's an actual comic that was adapted into a DC animated movie. And Darwin Cook, who had passed away a couple, who has passed away a couple years ago, um, was just a phenomenal artist. I mean, his art is still incredible, and he's worked on works for DC such as The Spirit, Batman, and apparently Justice League. Um, and this com this uh, movie is actually one of the ones that got me into a lot of uh, DC animation in general, besides things like Batman Beyond and Batman the Animated Series. But yeah, I just fell in love with the movie and wanted to have it um, on Blu-ray. I highly recommend it because it's still from that era of DC animation where adapted DC material has its own kind of feel. A lot of the DC animated movies you see today, which are, I guess, Reign of the Superman or, uh, oh gosh, Young Justice, things like that, a lot of the DC animation uh, adopts, a lot, adapts, adopts a lot of its style from Phil, Bar Phil Barbosa style. I think it's Phil Barbosa, maybe Phil Barosa or Phil Barbosa. I forget. Either way, the style is kind of unique, and uh, I mean, it's unique, but it's also become more uniform, and therefore doesn't have as much character as I enjoyed when I watched movies like this, or Batman Year One, or Batman The Dark Knight Returns, the animated uh, adaptations of those comic book storylines. Either way, this is a fantastic 
um, animated feature. I enjoyed it, and it's just cool to see this reimagining of these classic DC heroes. Next, we have Kingdom Hearts 3. I've actually had this game pre-ordered since about, yeah, 2012, 2013. So now that it's 2019 and it dropped in January, that means I've had this game pre-ordered for the better part of a decade, which makes you really question what I'm doing with my life. But that's all right. I'm doing fine. I promise. Either way, this is a little embarrassing because it is March as of me recording this video and I still have not played the game. I finally managed to open it, pop it in my PlayStation 4, uh, download the updates, and I forgot to actually play it because I had to go to work. Uh, you know, growing old grows old pretty quick. That being said, I need to actually set aside some time because I actually invested a little bit too much time in another game I bought in January uh, called Tetris Effect. I love Tetris. This is going to sound weird, but it's probably my favorite game ever. Heck, I love Tetris so much. I, I can't see it right now, but I love Tetris so much. I've got a book on Tetris by Box Brown. I, I've already displayed that in one of my in one of my uh, collection videos, but I just love the game Tetris. It's very relaxing and at the same time just very focus driven. And Tetris Effect takes that to a whole nother level. It's just insane gameplay. I love it. It's got great music. So if you're on a PlayStation 4, I recommend it. Maybe I'll do a Let's Play and do that very terribly if I figure out how to do that. But then we go into, I'm trying to remember if I got any other games. No, I think that was it. Um, actually, I think that's everything. Yeah, wow. That's everything that I actually got for January of 2019. So, guys, thanks for sticking with it. Um, that's a lot to go through, but if you're interested in anything that I got or the breakdown of that, I've listed all of those items discussed today down below. So, please check that out in the details. And, as always, if you got any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please drop a line down below. I do read the comments, I promise. And, heck, especially if you're down there in the comments and you have anything you want me to do a review on or give my short thoughts on, please go ahead and drop that comment down below so I can see it and maybe I can whip up a review real fast or, you know, just kind of go on a rant about it. I'm willing to do that as well. That being said, y'all, if you liked today's video, please hit that like button. If you really liked it, please hit the notification button or the subscribe button. And if you really, really liked it, share it out to your mates, your buddies. So thank you guys so much for tuning in. This has been another episode of King's Comics and I'll see y'all soon.